get up and greet each other and say good morning and welcome to our at this church. So get up and greet each other.
Um, you'll notice that if we did that in silence this morning, Nancy is at a family reunion with Waverly in Kentucky. And while they were there, they knew they were going to be grandparents, but they found out that they are expecting twin grandsons. So I know they're either watching online or going to watch later. So congratulations from all of us. Let's stand this morning for our opening music.
the continued healing and the wonderfulness of having toddlers in your house, right, and, and going to daycare. You have a yellow card that's inside your bulletin. This is a place where you can not only record your attendance, but also any prayer concerns or things you want to lift up. So at this time, we're going to pass our prayer concerns to the middle, and we're going to sing our prayer song.
heads. And sometimes, Lord, we do not pay attention to that. We are so blessed. And we are even more blessed by the fact that we can give back to you. And we must, Lord, we must continue on the work you have us do. We are truly your hands and feet. We need to step forward, do as you will, Lord. And please guide us in the place you would have us go. And we pray these things in your holy son's name. Today comes from Luke, Luke 1, 11 through 20, and 26 through 30. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zachariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zachariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and a delight to you, as many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord, their God. And he will go before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared. For the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, How can I be sure of this? I am an old man, and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and will not be able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. Luke 1 26 through 3. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, the town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, for you are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You, are, you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who has said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month, for no word of God shall ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Here is the word of God. So good morning. As I stated already, I am not uh, Pastor John the man. I am Courtney Hilbert. And I was going to yell at Terry for making me cry, but now I'm going to yell at everyone because you all made me cry before the operatory song. So let's quiet our hearts and come together and pray with me, please. Precious Holy Father, we just ask that you send your Holy Spirit in this place. Fill it. Fill each and every crevice. Fill each and every person. Allow our hearts to be open to you that we might be on fire for your word, for your presence, and for you, dear Lord. Allow everything that shines through us to be your glory. Lord God, I pray right now that you might have me behind the cross and that all of the words uttered might be truly a reflection of you and to your son's name. In your precious Holy son, we pray. Amen. So how many of you are involved with children, have children in your lives, have young people in your lives at any point in time, whether 20 years ago, two days ago? Great, just a show of hands. If you have any experience with young people, everyone can take my quiz then. Okay, so I would like you to hold your answer to the end, but I'm going to ask you to vote between answer A and answer B. Answer A. Johnny, please take out the trash. But why? I'm not sure I'm strong enough to take out the trash, and I don't really think it's my responsibility. How will I ever do it? Johnny, you have two arms and two legs. Take out the trash. Okay. Or B. Johnny, please take out the trash. Okay, which door should I use to take out the trash? You can use the front door. Cool. So who likes A? Yeah, one for A. Yeah, we got like two people. Who likes B? Right? B, we 
like that answer, right? Because it's an enthusiastic answer. It's an answer that says, I believe that you're sending me to do something worthwhile. I believe in you and your authority. There is a right way to say yes. Obedience has two options. It can be defiant or it can be faithful. One response doubts the leader, and the other response simply asks for guidance. In our scripture references today that Angela read so beautifully, we read a very familiar passage, and though you aren't having some sort of delusion, it's not Christmas time. But for many of, a, of us who've been in the church a while, we've heard Zechariah's meeting with Gabriel and Mary's meeting with Gabriel very often during the Advent season. I would imagine between Christmas and Bible studies and personal studies, I've probably heard or read the first chapter of Luke a couple dozen times. But this summer, Pastor Jonathan challenged us to read a gospel through the lens of what did Jesus do, looking for Jesus' actions. And I was really excited to have a new way to look at the scripture, and so I jumped in, and I started reading the book of Luke. Well, the first chapter of Luke really doesn't have Jesus doing anything, because, you know, he's not born yet. Don't want to ruin the surprise. First chapter, he's not born yet. So, in the past, I've read these two stories fairly confused. I mean, it seemed odd that Zechariah was struck mute for questioning Gabriel, but Mary was treated with kindness and tenderness. It didn't seem fair to me. They both asked Gabriel a relatively simple question, yet they were treated quite differently. But when I started to read Luke through the, the eyes of action, I recognized the difference in the verbs in each of these sentences. Let's look at Zechariah first. How can I be sure of this? I'm an old man. My wife is well along in years. So translation, dude, this is crazy. My wife's old, I'm old, retired. There's no way we're having a baby, right? That is, that's the Courtney version of the gospel, right? Come to you, September 9th. I'm just telling you, you want to come. It's a lot of fun. It seems like a relatively rational question, but what Zechariah is really doing is questioning God's ability to be God. He doubts that God will do what he says he will do. Sure is often translated as the word certain. He wanted to know, without a shadow of a doubt, that this thing was going to happen. Zechariah allowed his human condition to defy God. But I'm going to tell you a secret. Are you ready? God isn't human. He isn't constrained by what we are constrained by. God does not live within the confines of what can and cannot be. I do believe that Zechariah's response okay, let's just say a prayer really quick. Let's just all bow our heads and pray. Holy God, we just lift up to you and everything we just ask that you be a guiding hand that your presence might be here and you might be healing. So that we ask for your presence, your peace, and your patience.
Lord God, we just lift up your healing touch to Pat, and we just ask that you give her your calmness and just feel your grace. Lord God, we pray that she is in the hands of a very talented doctor and soon in the hands of wonderful first responders. We just pray, Father God, that you might be with her and with each and every one of them as they help to administer your healing touch. In your precious holy son's name. Amen. So, we don't live, God does not live by the normal human confines. But I do believe Zechariah's response is normal. If an angel came to you and said, Hey, Terry, you're going to have a baby. And your baby is going to be the prophet of Jesus. Right? See, like, let's look at Terry. Right? So everyone, I think, you normally would be like, you're crazy, Gabriel. Regardless of the fact that here comes an angel of the Lord. When I first took one of my uh, a fiction writing workshop and you're passing your writing samples back to a teacher, I got a note that said, quote, show, don't tell. I was really confused by this because I thought writing, she plopped into a chair, was pretty showy, right? She plopped into a chair. As I sent that note back, I could feel the instructor's sigh come through the other end of the computer. You see, show writing allows a, writer, a reader to feel what is going on around them instead of being told about the action. The same is true for each and every one of us in life. I think as human beings, we want to be shown in order to believe. We struggle to just believe what someone tells us without physical proof. But by believing without seeing, we are doing exactly what we are called to do in faith. In John chapter 20, verse 29, Jesus says, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. That is what we are called to do, to believe in faith. Zechariah's response was a show response. It was filled with doubt about God's ability to overcome human, human frailties. But Mary's was not. How will this be since I'm a virgin? Mary's question to Gabriel went. It's not a question of doubt. Brother Mary is asking Gabriel to say, so what's my part in God's miracle? What am I supposed to do? God's got this under control, but you came to me for a reason. So what am I supposed to do? It is asked in faith, knowing that God will do what he said he will do. Curiosity about our role is not doubt. God doesn't dislike questions. Asking questions in faith is how we grow in our communication with God. If we go back to Johnny's second response, he didn't doubt that he could or was supposed to take out the garbage. He just asked how he was supposed to accomplish his task. Mary believes God will do the impossible because she knows God is a God of impossibilities. She asked a clarifying question just to find out what her role is. Mary said yes the right way. She responded to God's call in obedience, asking for guidance. Zechariah's response to God's call was with doubt and suspicion. When we are called by God, we rarely know the end state of the calling. God nudges us to take a step in faith, but we rarely know where the end of the race will lead us. In a world that requires proof, data, and facts to make any decision in a world where doubt is more prevalent than belief. How do we become a people who truly walk by faith and are able to say yes when God calls rather than, I'm not sure? Years ago, a friend's little boy would go all over. He had zero fear. And he'd often go near the stove and she would say, now, get away, the stove is hot. Get away, the stove is hot. And one day, he reached out and touched the stove and burned his hand and went, hot! It's one of his first words, hot. From that moment on, you could tell this little boy anything was hot, and he would step back and say, hot. <laughs> and maybe one time when I was babysitting this little boy and we were at the park on a blanket, I told him that grass was hot so he wouldn't leave the blanket. Now, in retrospect, that was probably pretty manipulative, but it worked, right? Because we, we are truly a product of our past experiences. Our belief system 
by what we have experienced in the past. So if our beliefs are structured by what we know, how are we supposed to say yes to the impossible when all of our personal history and our current situation tells us we can't? Learning to say yes in faith rather than fact requires discipline. We need to train ourselves to believe God will do what he says he will do, even when experience tells us something completely different. First, we need to study the word. We need to study God's word. Because we are a show, don't tell people, we need to read the stories of how God did the impossible over and over and over again. Through active study of God's word, his ability to consistently work outside the confines of the human condition and scientific fact will begin to transform our minds to believe that God can do anything and he will always do what he says he will do. Second, just like in baseball, we need to practice and we need to practice and we need to practice some more. We need to try to do something, anything we feel God is calling us to do, especially if you do not feel you have the skills to do it on your own. Perhaps you're feeling called at this moment to serve as a youth leader, and you want to come on September 9th to learn more about it. It is a shameless plug, I will not lie. But I will say each August, I start to pray about what God wants me to do for youth in, in a new season coming in, and I always feel overwhelmed. And I always feel like I can't. And I always feel like it's too much. And I'm usually in tears at some time around August 20th. And invariably, God does something that draws me in. And this year, he had, me, he had a text sent to me from one of our youth kids who does not go to this church, asking, when is you starting back up again? I'm real excited to see it. And how can you not be inspired to keep taking one step after another when you get that kind of confirmation from God? Third, we need to pray. We need to pray, and we need to pray, and we need to pray again. Through prayer, we will become more in tune with the voice of God. We will begin to understand what God is speaking to us rather than just listening to our own internal dialogue. God's voice is clear. God's voice is distinctive. And as we read in 1 Kings 19, his voice is often soft, quiet, like a whisper. It's not loud and booming. The more disciplined we are in our prayer life, in our communication language with God, the more we will understand what he is calling us to do. And we will be able to respond with clear, Yes, Lord. There's an old saying that says God doesn't call the equipped, he equips the called. When God calls you to do something, your only contribution, the only thing you need to bring to the table is one word. Yes, Lord. How do you want to use me? And we have dozens of examples. If you wonder how this is done, you can just look to your right and your left in the church pews. If we start to go down the list, I'm going to just name a couple. Vicki Babber and Patty Upperman felt called that there was a ministry need in this church for people who were grieving. And out of that, that came fruit of the Grief Share Ministry. And now they don't only minister to those inside of our church, but outside our church walls and the entire Groveport community. Kathy Ballstick felt called that we needed someone to coordinate all those volunteers for those youth activities and children's activities. And now she coordinates every single volunteer that does junior church, that does nursery, that does a youth activity, that is the Sunday school listener. Because God nudged her. Brian Johnson felt called to move our church beyond the walls of this building and make us microphone free. Look at my hands, everybody who's been in Bible study with me. Yes? <laughs> Right? And so he went on that path and let God lead him. And now, right now, our worship service is being streamed into homes across the state, into homes across this country, into homes across this world. 
because Brian listened. The list could go on and on. Terry listened and now started the community choir that's raised tens of thousands of dollars for Groveport communities. We have countless congregants that have said yes, Lord. And they didn't know how they were going to do it. They just knew God was going to help them through it. I'm going to take a moment of privilege and tell you about a yes that happened a year ago. And a year, a year ago, at one of our bi-monthly ministry table meetings, the topic of the opioid epidemic came up in our church. And we sat around and talked about what could we do, what could we do. And if you've ever been to a church meeting, you know that talk can go on and on. <laughs> go to the next meeting. It can go on and on and on. And we had one hand that was raised. I said, I'll do it. I'll take the leap. And that was my mom, Jeanne Hilbert. She didn't know how she was going to do it. But she said, yes, I feel God calling me to do this. I'm going to do it. Now, she could have responded the way Zechariah responds and said, I'm old. Sorry, Mom. <laughs> a lot of my plate. Are you a bunch of other volunteer activities? I'm the queen of growth court. I don't have time for all of this. But she did it. She said, yes, Lord. Now show me the way. And with that first response of yes, she reached out to dozens of government agencies, to local first responders, to city council, to the Franklin County um, Board of Health, to the school district. We had people at that first meeting from seniors in high school to senior citizens. And since that first meeting, we've had four different Voices of Broke Court sessions where people have been trained on everything from awareness to the, the spread of drugs within this community and within this country and also getting them trained on how to help people and find the signs. All because one person said yes. All because one person said yes. Now, I don't want to think about the people who would not have Narcan in their pocket today or would not be aware of what their kids are going to face when they go into high school or who wouldn't be aware of the treatment facilities that exist. If mom had said, I'm old. I'm tired. I can't. Or conversely, if some youth kids had said, I'm too young, I'm too busy, I can't be there. Or the firefighters hadn't helped. Or, the, or Jeff at the school district hadn't been this awesome communication guy. If someone of those people had not said yes, where would we be today? And thankfully, we don't have to know the answer. Lives are being transformed because people in this church said yes. They didn't say yes, but I need to know where the race ends. They didn't say yes, but here are my rules, God, for me to say yes. They just said yes. And like we read in Psalm 119, 105, they said, yes, Lord, let your word be a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It doesn't say, I'm going to be a light at the end. It says, I'm going to be a light along the way. God can do all things. Not all things within our limited understanding, but all things. And he is calling each and every one of you, regardless of your age, regardless of your physical condition, regardless of your circumstances, he is calling each and every one of us to respond Yes. Will you respond like Zechariah in doubt and reluctance? Or will you respond, respond like Mary with faith and curiosity? There is a right way to say yes. Will you pray with me? Holy God, we just ask that you continue to feel this place. We pray for Pat as she goes to get treatment, we pray that you might bless her and make her feel strong and whole. Holy God, we just pray that you continue to prepare our hearts for this moment of this holy sacrament that we are going to participate in together today. Lord God, help us to say yes to you in a very right way. In your precious voice, our name. Amen. Today we do have the opportunity to say yes, Lord, as we come to the table that the Lord sent, set 2,000 years ago. I'm going to ask uh, Pastor Jim Burge to come up and, and help me this morning uh, because I am not ordained. So technically, I'm just 
assisting. So I'm going to ask Pastor Jim to come up here. This table that was set in the upper room was laden with simple foods of the Passover. But God took the simple and transformed them into holy sustenance. He created the time of communion as a sacrament of remembrance. The time when bread and a simple cup are transformed into holy body and blood of Christ. A symbol to remind us God will do what he says he will do. <coughs> this is meant for us to remember that through Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, through the sacrifice of his body and his blood, we are reconciled with God. We are made holy through his blood. Communion reminds us that God is greater than any <coughs> sin we could ever commit. That through the cross, God once again performed the impossible. He transformed a fallen people into a holy nation. Through Jesus' sacrifice, we are reunited with God. We take the bread and the cup as a reminder of this unbelievable act of God doing the impossible for those who say, Yes, Lord. Courtney and I bless these elements. We ask that each of us would bow our heads and hearts upon remembrance of those who stand in need presently, but to each one of us as we receive these blessed gifts of body and blood of Jesus Christ, the symbols thereof. Pray that God's Spirit may reach down to your heart and fill you with His goodness. Courtney, who bless the bread. Lord God, we ask that you might transform this bread into your true body. That as we take it into our beings, that we might be transformed and reunited with each of your precious holy gifts. Lord God, we thank you for the gift of your sacrifice and the, and the Son who sacrificed his body on behalf of each and every one of us. For Father, likewise, we ask your blessing to rest upon this juice, the symbol of our life life-given blood of Jesus Christ to each of us, that we might be redeemed and receive your grace. Bless us as we partake. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. This is not the service of the Grove Court United Methodist Church. This is the service of the Lord. If you are here and you are not a member of this congregation, we invite you Supper with us. We ask as the elements are passed to you that you please hold them until we have the blessing on those elements. Hope you will bless the bread and I will end the juice and then we will take together. May the communion stewards will come forward, please.
drink ye all of it in remembrance of me. Shall we partake together? Thank you for the prayers that you have answered here in this morning. And ask that you would continue to walk with us. These things we ask in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Please show me the way. Amen? Amen. Amen. 